What's up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here, then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? For today's video, we're just gonna roll into it because I am so excited to let you guys know that I got the chance to speak to, little old me, I got the chance to speak to one of my favorite nonfiction authors called Daisy Dunn. Daisy Dunn is not only the author of Catullus' Bedspread, and In the Shadow of Vesuvius, which are two books that I have reviewed here on the channel. But she is also a very established journalist here in the UK. So the fact she took time out of her day to speak to me and my audience, I feel like a celebrity, you guys. But today's chat with Daisy does not only revolve around Mount Vesuvius and the life of Catullus. We also get into her newest release, which is called Not Far From Brideshead. And we talk about her other projects, including her newest book, which is still planning and in the works, but we get a little bit of a snippet of that towards the end of the video, so you guys are gonna wanna stick around. I wanna take this chance though, right before rolling into the video, to thank Daisy for sitting down and chatting to me and even giving me a fraction of her time. It means the absolute world. And I'm so excited to roll this interview for you guys. So with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy it. Daisy, thank you so much for joining me today on the channel. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So I thought, because I'm a really nosy host, I'm a really nosy interviewer, that we could start this off by asking you about your classics journey. So where did that start? When did you first discover classics? And uh, how did it end up with you being this incredibly established woman in the field? <laughs> well, that's very kind. Um, I wasn't aware that classics was a course that you could do at university for a really, really long time. I think I was probably about 16, 17 before I'd even heard of classics being a subject um but I, I'd say sort of all the way back through my childhood I was really really interested in ancient sites so whenever we went on holiday I was always looking at all the stuff the amphitheaters and the Roman baths and mosaics and I, I really liked the sort of the, the history of those without really knowing very much about it um and I took up Latin at school when I was about 12 and I thought this is quite cool I quite like sort of learning a new language in a way that wasn't like learning French or German or something else. So that kind of hooked me. And then I ended up doing a GCSE in Latin. And at that point I realized I hadn't taken up Greek and for a university course um, at that time, it was a lot more open now, but when I was kind of applying to do a classics course, kind of you kind of needed a bit of Greek. It was kind of more normal to have some Greek. So I did a GCSE in Greek while I was doing my other A-levels. So from scratch, so my Latin teacher came over to my house on a Friday night, because I was that cool kid, <laughs> and taught me Greek. Um, so that's why I did my spare time uh, as a teenager. And then I went off to Bryanston Greek camp uh, for the two summers in a row in Dorset and really sort of tried to hone my language skills. And then ended up going to Oxford to read classics. And while I was there, I was on the course that was called at the time 1B, maybe it's still called that, I'm not sure, which meant that I had intensive Greek lessons every single day, which I actually loved. But it was 9 a.m. in the morning uh, for the first year and a half doing sort of Greek language and translation and prose composition and sort of learning in a really, really thorough way and actually at that point the, my Greek overtook my Latin which is <laughs> probably sort of, you know, a good thing uh, at that point I just I really love the language and sort of alongside of that I think it was just I love the literature I love the art I love the history and for me it was finding a course that sort of incorporated so many of my different interests so, which I know probably isn't a very original thing to say I think lots of people come to classics because they enjoy so many different things they don't want, want to sort of limit themselves to doing to doing one um, but for me that really kind of how true. No, I mean, that's really interesting because I actually haven't spoke to somebody who came at it from a language point of view. Like the majority of people I speak to, which there's nothing wrong with this. And that's how I got into classics is from the stories, you know, like, oh, we hear the myth of the Minotaur and I want to see what the real story is. So hearing that somebody came at it from the language perspective is really interesting because as a teenager, at least for me, because I started Latin at around the same age, like 11, 12, I was like, this is the biggest waste of time. I don't want to do this anymore. And then, you know, now I'm sitting here like fumbling through Virgil constantly. But so the irony of that is shocking. I think it's changed so much. I just remember being that age and sort of talking to my parents who'd done Latin in, at school in a really traditional way where I think learning language was completely divorced from any context. So they were just having to sort of do rote learning, declensions, verbs. Um, 
And I think the way that we were taught was so much of bringing in the history and the stories and everything else. It just seemed part of a broader package. So you actually had the context for it and you can kind of see the, the point of it rather than just having to learn something for the sake of learning it. So I think it's all those things feeding together, which you know wasn't necessarily the case back in back in the day. Well, this makes perfect sense coming to your books because your books do actually come at everything from a language point of view with the ancient books that I want to discuss today. But because I have this book sitting here, we should probably do uh, your newest book, which is not far from Brideshead first. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what to expect from this book? Yeah, so uh, this is the book I brought out in spring. And I think when you first look at the title, you can sometimes think, is this a classics book? <laughs> is it not a classics book? Uh, it is absolutely a classics book. Um, it's a book about a group of classicists who were thriving in the sort of 1920s and 1930s, the interwar period in Oxford. And I'm just, I've, I've always been interested in early 20th century history. And I had a kind of chance encounter. I went up to North Yorkshire for a literary festival when I was on tour with one of my previous books. And when I was there, I went to Castle Howard, which is a beautiful, beautiful place, and which I'd kind of recognised from seeing the, the TV adaptation of Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited. And I walked in, there's an amazing amount of ancient statuary and portrait busts and everything else. And I just kind of started Googling about, I think I must have had classics in the same line as, as Castle Howard. Anyway, I found out that Gilbert Murray, who's one of the sort of titans of classical scholarship in the 20th century, that he had married into the family that inhabited Castle Howard. So I thought that's so strange. I never knew that. I'd read loads of his books when I was a student, but I'd never thought, I still say in the book, I, I, you never Google the guys in your bibliography. Like you don't think I'm gonna look up this person's life. And I really wished I had because so many people who were writing books in the 1920s and 1930s, writing you know, really serious works of classical scholarship, they actually lived incredibly diverse and really colorful lives. There were some of them, some of them involved in the war, they were doing sort of intelligence work, some of them, they were doing all kinds of things, pol political work. And it was a, a period of sort of great change. So I thought it'd be really interesting to look at, I sort of focused in on a trio of classical figures. So Morris Barra, Gilbert Murray and E.R. Dodds. And they kind of connect you to so many of the really well-known figures of the period. So everyone from Virginia Woolf to Louis McNeese, W.H. Auden, huge range of people. They're kind of like almost the invisible connections between these figures that maybe the broader public will be more familiar with than those three names that probably won't know unless you've been sort of studying classical scholarship and read their, their books before. But it's kind of, it was an interesting time because you've got uh, the Nazis picking up a lot of ancient classical material and subverting it for their own ends. So you've got them sort of mining the works of Plato to try and justify their eugenics program and you know really horrendous things happening with classics. And then you have a sort of trio of people who are really trying to champion ancient history and to tell it as it was and to try and keep it alive. So it's basically it's a story of, of classical scholarship and the worth of classical scholarship but from a 20th century lens. I think that's so important though, like when you told me about this book over email, I was like, wait, this is so intriguing because, you know, obviously classics is important, but figuring out who also was really fighting for it as well through history is such an important part of the classic story. You know, it's a continuing thing that happens even now of people who are, you know, fighting for the uh, marbles to go back to Greece, the Parthenon marbles, like all of that is still part of the same story and the same history. Oh, completely. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think we, you almost too easily, you separate things out. You think, okay, I'm going to do my ancient history here. This is my Greek history. This is my Roman history. This, but everything's a lot more fluid than that. And I like the kind of idea that, you know, classics, we always say classics isn't dead, you know, like we're all very much saying there's no such thing as dead languages, everything else. This kind of story, like you really come to believe that and you see why that's the case. And I think it become you become more passionate about defending classical scholarship as a result of it because you see how many lives it, it changed historically. Now, something that I want to talk about is the voice in all of your books, because this is sort of an overarching point that I've said in all of the videos that I've made on your books, which I'm such a fan girl. As soon as I said that, like came out of my mouth, I was like, oh my God. Um, but something that I've said in all my videos is that I think the way you approach these, these topics with the voice that you write in, is so great like it's so relatable it's so easy to follow and in my last video i realized it was it was a lot like watching a documentary you know it's like you know why we're here we know why we're here you're going to give us the information that we need but you're going to do it in such a digestible and wonderful way which is something i love about all of them because obviously it's the same um voice so i was wondering if that's a voice that you 
is it one that you were conscious of when you were writing or is it one that you know just sort of comes out naturally well first of all I don't want to like sort of be super kind of fangirl back but I was a fan of the, the videos and you're the first person who's kind of drawn that parallel between sort of my way of writing and documentaries I thought that was really and it was a really interesting way of thinking about it and not something I kind of consciously thought about myself while while writing and I think I think with 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 right as sort of a writer's voice it's one of those things that develops really quite slowly over time so I did a PhD in classics and when you're writing a thesis you've got 100,000 words to play with you have to write it in quite a, as, as, as a particular kind of style you have to kind of adopt for writing in an academic um, kind of way and then when you come to writing a book you basically have to forget all of that and have a completely different voice in your head because I was kind of decided from from the outset that I wanted to write for a broad audience or an audience who hadn't necessarily come across any classical material whatsoever. I didn't want that to matter. You know, I want people to pick up my books who have never studied Latin, never studied Greek, never really known anything about it. That shouldn't be an obstacle to picking up one of my books and hopefully enjoying enjoying it and sort of going on the journey. So I think with in terms of your my writing, my writer's voice, it's I'm very conscious throughout of trying to be approachable of avoiding kind of technical jargon and I think there's a sort of a real difference I think when you're doing academic writing you have a whole kind of scaffolding and that scaffolding has to be really visible you have your end notes you have your footnotes you have a kind of explanation of what you're doing when I'm writing a book that scaffolding is probably even more elaborate than it is in my academic writing but it's completely invisible and that's my business to make it invisible so that anyone can enjoy it so that's kind of what I guess is in my head and with writing I guess it's something I've done for a long time I've done sort of quite a lot of work as a journalist before then and you develop a voice over time so now when I write it's just what comes out on the page naturally but when I began that definitely was not the case <laughs> Well, I love it because if we start with, uh, and this is just the book that is on top of the pile that I have here, but Catullus' Bedspread, which um, I feel really awkward saying this to you in person, but I don't like Catullus as like a human from the ancient world. Um, I loved your book, but he's a very odd person for me. But um, that was a voice that really helped me get through that book because as somebody who doesn't like him, I could attach myself onto different parts of the book because, you know, you have this way of, dotting in and out of things as well. So it was really weird. It was such a personal experience reading that book because I felt like any time my attention wavered when I was reading it, being like, okay, Catullus is being a sad boy. That's really great. I'm very happy about that. Um, then all of a sudden you like recaptured me and you were like, oh, Julius Caesar is doing this now. And I was like, great. Okay, let's move, you know, um, which was really weird. I've never had that reading a book. So in that context, with just discussing how you jump in and out of things, why is it important to you to understand all parts of a story and not just a singular part of a story? So with Catullus, it was important to us to understand what was going on in Rome as well as what's going on in Catullus's life. So why was that balance really important for you? I think with, I mean, Catullus is one of those, those poets. I mean, I have to say I've got a complete opposite. I love Catullus. I completely fell in love with him when I was 17 and that affair is still very much alive. Um, but when, when I was writing about him, I was aware that he's not, necessarily seen as an overtly political poet for example he is characterized today pretty much you know as a love poet that's what he's known for for writing his love poetry particularly his lesbia cycle of this woman he called lesbia and I, I, I kind of was aware of the fact that when you actually pick up and you delve into all of those poems and you kind of read all of them together that that really isn't necessarily the case at all I mean I think he obviously he writes love and poetry but he was writing so many different genres together and drawing on so many different ideas and you do find political poems in there you do find criticisms of Julius Caesar who happened to be a friend of his father for example um, you find sort of allusions to what's going on politically and I think with Catullus in particular he was living at such an important time historically he's living at the end of the Roman Republic where people are kind of hurtling towards this really uncertain Future. There's a feeling that a kind of status quo is unraveling and something different is on the horizon, but no one can say for sure what that is. And sort of you know, for, for much of the Romans' history, since the kings, you know, right at the very beginning, um, the idea of having kind of one-man rules being quite frightening. 
but suddenly you've got Julius Caesar emerging on the scene and he's initially with Pompey the Great and Marcus Licinius Crassus, his very kind of ruthless money lender, and they form this triumvirate uh, for power. Um, but it's clearly, I think slowly Julius Caesar is kind of emerging to the fore and you find Catullus referencing Caesar and the Gallic Wars. And so I think through Catullus's poems, you actually get quite an interesting perspective on a really landmark time in Roman history. So that's why I kind of wanted to use that approach of bringing in so much of what's going on. Also, there's the fact that we know so little about Catullus himself. I sat down at the beginning and I can discuss this book with my agent and I was like, okay, there are about six facts that we know about Catullus's life, which, you know, writing a biography is quite difficult um, with six facts to play with. What I decided to do instead was to tell a story, uh, kind of write a life as Catullus writes it. So it's kind of the life that he presents for himself in his poems and a very much a huge sort of underpinning, the historical underpinning of that is what's going on politically and, you know, looking at the Gallup Wars and, and everything else that's kind of playing into uh, his poetry at that time. So when you discovered Catullus at 17, you said, that was like the first time you read him. Were you reading him in translation then or in Latin? I was doing Latin A-level and he was on the set texts. So I hadn't really heard of Catullus and I sat down and I just remember the first class, I think we were given poem five or something, which is the one which is, we're well, Miss May Lesbia, let us live, my lesbia, let us love. And I just remember thinking, reading some of this, that the sort of lines were saying, give me a hundred kisses, then a thousand kisses, then a thousand. I was thinking, is this really poetry? It just, it just didn't seem any, like anything I'd been reading in sort of my English lessons or anything else. It just seemed so surprising. It was almost too kind of chatty and conversational and quite colloquial. But I think that's what kind of turned me on to him because it was just so different and unexpected. And it seemed kind of like it was breaking rules. And I quite like a kind of a subversive person maybe. So I, that's <laughs> kind of what I like. So I was literally, reading I don't know we, we did about six of the kind of the slightly easier poems and then we went on to doing some of the the longer poems and I I just it just took my fancy it's difficult to to say but I just remember the excitement I think it's yeah, because it just seems so different from reading you know Julius Caesar's books or you know Plato of what I was doing in, in translation that time or anyone else. And I think I saw, this is also going to sound like such a fangirl thing to say, but I think I saw one of your other interviews, you said that poem 64 was your favourite poem, or at least the one that you named the book after because it's the bedspread poem. So I was wondering what it was about that poem then as you were speaking that drew you in, like why was that one different? Okay, so poem 64 is quite different from the rest of Catullus's poems. I think with Catullus's poems, you get used to some quite bawdy ones. There are some really quite rude ones. Um, some quite naughty poetry on the whole. 64 is not like that. It's a lot more emotionally deep, I think. Um, it's the longest poem in the collection. It's a little over 400 lines. And ostensibly it's about the wedding of Achilles' parents. So Peleus, who was one of the Argonauts who went to get the Golden Fleece and Thetis, who's a sea nymph. So it describes the wedding and then suddenly there's this massive digression in the middle where Catullus starts describing the pattern on their wedding bedspread. And that is so much more than a description. It's like a whole world that opens up and it's about Ariadne and Theseus. So you get this kind of story within a story. And I, just, I hadn't come across it, anything like that again. That's kind of seemed really new uh, to me and it was quite, complex so there's it's, it's a complex poem it's a difficult poem to to get to grips with because there are a lot of kind of inconsistencies in terms of the timelines but he gave sort of Ariadne the most kind of modern speech I'd ever read and she's there saying you know basically I don't want to be sort of spoiler alert but um Theseus takes off he kind of loves her and leaves her after she helps him to navigate the labyrinth to kill the minotaur and she's left kind of weeping on the beach and she sees his ship departing. And then she's saying, you know, let no woman trust a man. Like they're all liars. You know, they want one thing and then they go. And it just seemed like it, maybe this is when you're reading it at 17, it just chimed like <laughs> quite accurately. Maybe my expectations or maybe it shattered my expectations of, of what love was, but it seemed so kind of 
relatable. Um, and I just couldn't believe that that was written in the first century BC. So I think that's what it was at the end of the day. So I, I, I kind of used that poem to, to weave the kind of the narrative of my book around. That's kind of the centerpiece of it. And with poetry, this was something that really plagued me as I was reading it and genuinely plagued me. Um, because it's also part of your other one, because you did the translations for the letters of Pliny as well yourself, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Right, yeah. so you're translating all this stuff by yourself and you're figuring out the lives of these people that you write in your books through their words, like not through secondary sources, it's through them. So when it comes to the poems and then, of course, also when it comes to the letters, what was difficult about using that media? So like the poem that you just described, like how do you figure out the people behind their words when they're not writing biographies, you know? It's really challenging. I mean, I say so playing with poetry and playing with prose are two very different things. Um, with the letters of Pliny the Younger, there are hundreds of those surviving and they are quite sort of documentary in the way they're written. Um, they're kind of a form of history writing in a way. And I think Pliny himself was really conscious of trying to, to set things down so that he would be remembered himself as being a kind of great chronicler of his time. So they're incredibly useful from a historical point of view. When you're looking at poetry, like Catullus's poems, and so the idea of mythology, it's a lot more subjective, naturally. Uh, it's a lot more emotive. And I think you find a lot more of, of a person within it, in a way, I think, in a, a strange sense, when Pliny the Younger is writing letters, he's trying to almost separate himself from what he's writing about. When Catullus is writing poetry, he's pouring himself heart and soul into that. So that's kind of almost what I say when people say, oh, you know, you, you write a book about Catullus, we don't really know much about him. I, I think like, if you really read those poems, that's how you get close to somebody, because poetry is a really deeply personal thing. And so the only way you can get close to a dead poet is by really kind of reading their work hundreds of times. And I did read it hundreds of times. And I think you feel a real sense of that person through doing that. Uh, so in terms of writing about it, that definitely requires a different approach. So we've mentioned Pliny a few times and it just occurred to me that there might be people watching who don't know who the Plinys are because there are two. Um, do you want to just tell us who they are a little bit more and also maybe then tell us as well why you decided to use them as a vehicle for your book in the shadow of Vesuvius. Yes, so um, there are two Pliny's. For a long time, it was thought that there was just one uh, through history. So you've got Pliny the Elder, and he is was a great sort of natural historian. He wrote this amazing 37 volume encyclopedia of natural history. He wrote a load of German history, military history, which most of his work's been lost. We've got the encyclopedia, which is incredible. And he is really most famous for his death because he died during the eruption of Vesuvius. And he was survived by his maternal nephew, Pliny the Younger, who he actually adopted posthumously um, by order of his will. So even though that's, he, so Pliny the Younger is the maternal nephew, but he took the name Pliny kind of in honor of uh, his deceased uncle. And he really worshiped him and he became a senator. He became a lawyer. He bought up sort of houses. He was great sort of interested in sort of making wine and he tried to write poetry, which is really bad. He did like lots and lots of different things. Uh, traveled around Italy a lot. Like I'm always amazed at how far people traveled at that time. He had sort of villas all over the place. And he was quite straight laced, shall we say. He was definitely quite a serious chap, but he has kind of a lot of personal passions as well. And he left behind all these letters, which I've mentioned, um, some of which describe the uncle. One of my questions as I was reading it as well is because you do say on the cover of it, just that I can show everybody, you say this is a life of Pliny, right? Just so that everybody knows. Because it was so funny when I put up the, the book review on my channel, I had a lot of people say, oh, I was expecting more about the volcano. And I was like, but it, it tells you, like you just didn't read the full, cover of, of the book but one thing that I like about this whole subject and and the fact that you drew attention to these two men is that so many people know about Pompeii like that's which I think is an incredible thing that everybody's aware of it it's common knowledge and it's their little window into the ancient Roman world but what you do is really draw attention to the men and how we know about them so you're sort of adding on to everybody else's already existing knowledge were you conscious of writing it that way of saying because you open the book with the eruption of Pompeii as well so did you think about it that way of thinking well everybody knows Pompeii so we'll start with Vesuvius and then here are the people who matter in this story 
Exactly. So I think when you think back to classical history, the eruption of Vesuvius is one of those events that stands out. I think people have heard of it. People have often been to Pompeii, Herculaneum, the Bay of Naples. They've seen Vesuvius and they know what happened there. But what really struck me as fascinating was the fact that most of those people, you see the kind of the cast that they've made of a lot of the victims. Most of those people are completely anonymous. We don't know who they were, we don't know their names, we don't know what their professions are, except when we can kind of interpolate from the, the evidence that's actually in the ground. But the fascinating thing is that you have we, have, we know of two people who were caught up, precisely two, and they were Pliny and Pliny. So I just thought, this just seems like a really an interesting starting point for a book. You've got this incredible event, and then you've got the lives of two people who experienced it. So that's kind of what I wanted to do with the book. I wanted to use the eruption as my starting point and then kind of go back, look at the life of the older man who died in it and then the future of the young man who survived it. Because then that you kind of get a kind of an arc of, of history, which it covers, I mean, the book covers about nine different emperors in this period. It's like quite frantic. There's a lot of stuff going on. And it's just, a, you know, the first century AD is the period we're talking about. The eruption uh, was AD 79. So there's a lot that's going on. And I just thought these two people who were there give us insight into a lot of that as well. So how did you discover Pompeii, like yourself, in your academic journey? Was it from the volcano? Was it from the letters? Uh, it was from the volcano. So initially, I think I was studying um, well, a bit of both because I was studying the Cambridge Latin course at school. And I'm sure we love it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think I definitely heard of the eruption of the series before I got to that point in the course. Um, but I think that probably that moment made me think about the volcano a lot more. And then I went there um, and saw the volcano and saw um, a lot of the archaeology and the towns and everything else. And I thought it was just incredible having this, you know, it's cliche to call this kind of time capsule town, but it, you know, Herculaneum and Pompeii are that, you know, it's very rare that you find anything like that um, in terms of ancient preservation of, of, of cities and actually having a sense of how people lived. So I immediately was, I think, always just drawn to, to the livelihood of this and the, the fact that people were so going about their lives completely normally. And I think, that's why I wanted to focus on the book on, on life, you know, looking at these two men, what what happens, you know, what my burning question was, we've got this young guy who is 17, he witnesses all of this, but what happens to him next? Like I, I knew that he existed and I knew that he'd survived it, but I had no idea of what he grew up to do. And I, I didn't know until I started writing this book, what really had happened to Pliny the Younger. I'd read, you know, some of his letters at university, but I hadn't really got a concept of, of, of his kind of career or what kind of interesting things he did and it, I say in the book it's I mean it's kind of a modern question but to me it's, it's a really human one like you you live through a, a terrible disaster like that you witness so much death you lose a member of your family like how do you get over that how do you kind of rebuild your life and what do you do so that was kind of these are the things that were in my head when I sat down to write. But you don't only write about, you, I mean, you have these wonderful books and the one behind me, but you also have some other books, um, which I wrote down the names of because I knew I was going to um, fluff them up and I didn't want to. But you have a Ladybird expert series on uh, Homer and you have a book called Of Gods and Men, A Hundred Stories from Ancient Greece and Rome. Do you want to tell us a little bit about both of those? Yeah, so um, just after doing the, the Pliny's book, I decided to, to publish a book on Homer, which is about as short a book on Homer as you could possibly write. So I was given 7,000 words to do. So I, when, I, when I was growing up, I don't know whether you had these, but the Ladybird books. When I was a child, they had Ladybird books on everything. So you can buy them on, they had, there's little guides. So they basically they brought these out again as a series for adults. And um, I was given some Homer to do. And as a question of introducing Homer as succinctly as possible, and I, I can't remember how many pages it was, but each um, kind of section had to be a certain number of words because there was a picture illustrating it the other side. So it was actually an incredibly difficult book <laughs> to write. I thought when I had the brief of doing six or 7,000 words, I thought that would take me you know, a month. I can do that quite easy. It actually took months and months and months because you're having to boil down Homer to the bare essentials, but still trying to put across what we know about Homer, a little bit about the poems, the introduction to people who haven't read the Iliad or the Odyssey before. So 
it was a good challenge and sitting down with the artist and deciding on the pictures to illustrate those was, was really good fun and it's a book which is for suitable for children and for adults which I quite like um you know I think lots of us they did other things in that series about kind of climate change and nuclear power and all this kind of and stuff like that which I actually I've got a whole load of these books and I find them really useful <laughs> so home was my, my one for that and then I did uh, a, an anthology called of gods and men which is a selection of a hundred stories from Greece and Rome in my choice of translation so I've always been kind of interested uh, in translation so many of the great poems not least Homer have been translated like dozens of times and some of the translations are more successful than others but I wanted to kind of give a sense of the breadth of translation of classical stories so um, I've chosen kind of some which are really modern some which are this some writing there by Elizabeth the first that she translated there are people from all kind of different parts um Anne Carson you know modern writer who's translated um to do refugees and this version so I just tried to choose like a whole range of different translations and I had to edit down because you don't really have kind of stories I know we talk about myths but I wanted actual texts from the classical world so I had to kind of choose passages which kind of held their own as standalone standalone stories you know so I choose like an interesting passage from the Odyssey for example and find the translation so it's like a big book of these put together so you get a real sense of not just kind of the breadth of, of classical literature but the breadth of all the people who have really wanted to engage with it and translate it which I think kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about kind of this whole kind of idea of continuity of not having classical scholarship just stuck in the past it's nice to to think of the ways it's been carried forward and that this book was definitely largely about that. That sounds like a massive project how long did that take to to gather all of that together? It took over a year Oh so my it, took goodness. So it took again I thought oh that won't take very long but it did because then I wanted to write I did little introductions to each of them so again so you don't have to have any prior knowledge of I don't know the story of Daphne, Daphne and Chloe or whoever else I, I'm giving you like what you need to enjoy that story so um that's coming out in paperback at the end of this year as well which I'm really excited about so that's my kind of my next my next project in a way gosh so lots of summaries then for you at this point. The Homer one sounds impossible. I'm thinking like when I do my introductory episodes at the beginning when I start a series which is like we're going to do things book by book so we'll do book one, book two, whatever. I try to do one which is what do you need to know to get into this and I end up sitting in front of my camera for like maybe an hour just sort of rambling off things and then in editing I'm like what do people really need to know and then you've got to like cut that out and it is so difficult when I think your head is in it because you're like well this is important at some point you might want to know that but then you have to be like well if someone hasn't heard of this what is it realistically do they need for the story exactly i think it's it's harder to be concise than it is to give them everything it's definitely it's trying to decide sort of what the salient points are and then if you say one thing often you think oh no i need to have told them this before uh, so it kind of snowballs and you end up kind of picking up a lot more than you you actually need so i think in a way doing these concise books is is a massive challenge so you almost have to do the whole work like in, and then boil it down afterwards oh goodness i don't envy you for that but thank you for doing this for us so my last question my last real question that i had to ask you uh, that i literally wrote down because i was like don't forget to ask this question was and not ones that you've signed just that you know like not any projects that you've signed off on but do you have any projects in your mind that one day you would like to maybe start or maybe do I always have projects in my mind which are circulating. Um, I don't mind divulging of what I'm doing at the moment because it is my next, a big, big project. Um, so I am writing a whole new history of the ancient world um, and I'm doing it through the women of the time. So it's, <laughs> it's a big book which focuses and it doesn't mean that the men are not going to be in it, but I kind of, I got I got slightly bored of, of kind of coming across like the same, you, you think classical women, you think of Boudicca, you think of Cleopatra, you think of quite a small group of women. But I'm thinking, well, where are they the rest of the time? I, I've never read a history of the classical world which really has the women at the forefront. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm doing it as a complete history, but the women are very much at the fore and the men are in the background. Oh, this is so exciting. This is exactly what we need. This is the perfect place to end as well. Like now everyone's gonna be in such a good mood. I'm in such a good mood. <laughs> <laughs>
So thank you, Daisy, so much for joining me today on the channel. This was such like a nerdy little dream of mine to get you on after reading Catullus' Bedspread. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's really good fun. Thank you. And thank you for all your videos as well. They're really fantastic. So for all of you guys watching at home, you can buy all of Daisy's books via the description below. We've made it nice and easy for you. So if you've heard anything that you like, you can find any and all of the books down there. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Monique. We'll see you then.